in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to this service of worship at First United Methodist Church in Lockhart, Texas. I'm Pastor Clifton, and today we are diving into John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36, so this back half of chapter 3, and there's some real riches in it. I look forward to diving into it with you. I hope that this service blesses you in the prayers it helps you pray, the songs it helps you sing, and the word that it speaks in your mind and, I hope and pray, in your heart as well. Thanks for joining us, and the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray. Dear loving Father who is in heaven, we want to thank you for bringing us together for the worship of today. Thank you for your divine guidance. Thank you for the gift of life. As we begin the service today, we want to ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us through the worship time. We also ask for your presence to be with us. We honor and praise you for your mercies and goodness that always that is always following us. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. John testifies again about Jesus. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he had spent some time with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim, because there was plenty of water and people were coming there to be baptized. This was before John was put into prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all, the one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Amen. He must increase, but I must decrease. 
It's not so much the he must increase part that I have a problem with as the I must decrease. This teaching of John the Baptist here in John 3 has startled me since the first time I started reading the gospel. It's a teaching that requires us to grapple with it. What's this mean? Does it mean that Christian discipleship is ultimately some self-annihilating form of toxic spirituality? Is it ultimately a form of self-hatred? I don't think that's what it means. But we do have to reckon with it. How should we understand John the Baptist's teaching here in a spiritually helpful, spiritually truthful, and helpful way? Um, And we have to admit that sometimes we see unhealthy forms of Christian spirituality or better pseudo-Christian spirituality around uh, that are excessive in some way and that take teachings like this one and make them into a form of unhealthy self-hatred. Yet, I can contend that something very opposite is actually the case. Rather, I think that we can't really understand the mystery and the reality of human life and human love without affirming both parts of John the Baptist's testimony, the he must increase and I must decrease. This is John the Baptist teaching us this uh, about our relationship with Jesus. John the Baptist, who in John's gospel is sort of the uh, typical, the almost archetypal, not just prophetic figure, but witness, the figure of Christian witness and testimony, the finger pointing to Jesus as we've talked about. John the Baptist is presented to us in the gospels as an ascetic figure, as a locust eating, a Uh, rugged, camel-hair-wearing ascetic, someone who practices spiritual disciplines of self-denial and pursuit of God's holiness and purity and goodness. And yet, this teaching is delivered in the context of John the Baptist speaking of himself as the friend of the bridegroom who's cheering at the bridegroom's joy. So the picture, um, as in John 2, that John the Baptist is here calling to mind in John 3, is almost a wedding banquet, a a wedding scene. And so it's in the context of wedding-like joy that we hear John the Baptist give this teaching that Jesus must increase and he must decrease. It's almost like the way in which at a wedding one finds delight and joy in making everything not about oneself, but about the bride and groom, celebrating them. There's Something of that kind of joy in John the Baptist's Christian spirituality of self-denial, his Christian spirituality of, of decreasing in such a way that Jesus may be magnified. This verse always also calls to mind the teaching of St. Paul that Christ's power is made perfect in weakness. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, Uh, that the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. And so there's a way in which Christ's light and love is magnified in and shines through our weaknesses, not just our strengths, but our weaknesses as they're folded into his mercy. An old priest, Father Aidan Wilcoxon, used to tell me, that what it means to be a saint, using that word not just in the New Testament sense, but in the sense that Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and other Christians sometimes use it. Um, Father Aidan would tell me that to be a saint means to be transparent to the light of God. So in that way of thinking, the holiest people are not, not the people who are externally remarkable, but the people who let themselves be transparent or translucent such that light can shine through them, such that Christ's light can be seen through them. And that way of reading John the Baptist's spirituality, our spiritual project is to decrease in the sense of becoming permeable, becoming a conduit of and permeable by the light of God so that we can live radiantly, joyfully, humbly, 
and lightly, to take ourselves lightly so that we'll be authentic and the truest version of our true selves. So in other words, it's not our true self that decreases. It's our illusions, our false attachments, our affectations, our pride, our false pride that we let fall away in order that sort of our false ego decreases in order that Christ may increase, Christ may be visibly magnified in us in a way that's inseparable from our humble authenticity. One of my favorite shows um, in, a, in, a, in a good while, actually, is the show Cobra Kai, which in, initially was on Net, or YouTube, and now the first couple seasons are on Netflix, and the, the third season, I think, is scheduled to come out in, in January. Um, it's the sort of sequel to the Karate Kid movies from, uh, from the 80s, I think. You know, I've uh, always, since I was a kid, thought martial arts are super cool, and so I have a sort of nerdy interest in them. Um, I love this show. It's a really good show, really interesting in a lot of ways. Fair warning, it's definitely PG-13 at least due to, due to language. Uh, there's some 80s era bad words in it that are probably even more out of bounds now. Um, and just as a sort of refresher, the Karate Kid movies are about Danny LaRusso and, in a way, about Johnny Lawrence, too. And Danny LaRusso is the new kid in town, in a town in California, and he's an average-sized kid. He's new, and he gets bullied by Johnny Lawrence. Johnny is a bigger, stronger guy, um, and Johnny has a karate teacher, and that karate teacher is himself a bully. But Danny, the new kid, the underdog, learns this wise, wise and self-defense attuned style of karate from his mentor, Mr. Miyagi, who's himself a sort of humble handyman and janitor type. And eventually, uh, little Danny LaRusso even beats the bully Johnny Lawrence in a karate tournament. Okay, the TV show Cobra Kai picks up about 30 years later. It's sort of in the present day, which in season one is about 2018. And as it vividly depicts in the first 10 minutes, there's been a dramatic reversal in who's the underdog. Danny LaRusso, who was the poor kid and the new kid in town and the hero of the original Karate Kid movies, he's grown up to be, well, successful, wealthy, a successful uh, and flashy car dealer uh, with a great wife, great relationship with his wife, a couple of kids, and just in so many ways a model guy. Uh, in the community, seemingly so, and to a great extent he is who he seems to be. Johnny Lawrence, on the other hand, who was the bully and the villain in the old Karate Kid movies, uh, uh, hasn't had a lot of success over the years, either personally in relationships, in relationship with his kid, uh, or professionally. He's had a lot of seeming failure in lots of areas of his life. And there's a couple of really wonderful things uh, that I want to lift out of this show that I think illustrate in a helpful and vivid way something of what we might, the wisdom we might take from um, this teaching of John the Baptist that Jesus must increase and we must decrease. The first thing is this. As a viewer of Cobra Kai, in a really interesting way, it has you within the first few minutes um, realizing that you're going to root for both Danny LaRusso as an adult and Johnny Lawrence uh, and their kids and the other teens they eventually teach karate to, even as these two main characters and the karate schools they eventually start are in conflict with each other uh, and both have legitimate grievances against each other. Um, yet, as a viewer, you're rooting for all of these characters to grow and learn and do the good. Um, the show does a really great job of this, both of the sort of uh, mid-40s protagonists, Danny LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence, both are flawed, but both are also, by fits and starts, growing, becoming 
better. Uh, and in that way, I think the show is a, a more realistic show um, than many shows. Uh, and it's more realistic than many ways of viewing the world. It brings to mind for me the great Alexander Solzhenitsyn quote. Uh, Solzhenitsyn uh, was, of course, a, a, a Russian writer who was sentenced to eight years um, in a Soviet labor camp for criticizing Stalin in a private letter and went on to be uh, an important novelist and social commentator. And, and Solzhenitsyn's book, The Gulag Archipelago, um, he says this, that it says this, it was granted to me to carry away from my prison years on my bent back, which nearly broke beneath its load, this essential experience, how a human being becomes evil and how good. Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts. Inside us it oscillates with the years, and even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. That's this famous and unforgettable and insightful Solzhenitsyn quote. Um, and Cobra Kai helps us to see that. And having us root for all of the characters, Cobra Kai is a bit like Jesus reveals life to actually be. And so Cobra Kai in that way reflects something of the real world. We all genuinely have good in us. Longer, no matter how much we get tangled up in evil and wrapped into evil and lies and deception and deceit, no matter how bad we become, we all have good in us because this line between good and evil goes not between parties and states and classes, but between every human heart, through every human heart, and is in our human hearts. Um, and so Cobra Kai gives us the hope and shows us that we can all win in an ultimate sense, no matter who wins at family in this or that season of life, no matter who wins at career in this or that season of life, no matter who wins in the karate tournament, there's redemption on offer for all. It's made actual in Jesus for all, and all are invited to grow into it for our enemies as well as our friends, for those we delight being around in this life and for those that we can't stand, for Democrats and Republicans, for Democratic Socialists and Flat Earthers, for Chinese, Americans, French, Iranians, Mexicans, North Koreans, Everyone, everyone, in showing us a world where everyone can be redeemed and everyone can grow towards the goodness that is always in them, Cobra Kai is realistic in a way that many shows and many ways of seeing the world are not. In Jesus, the call to divine goodness is in everyone and to everyone. In Jesus, that personal presence of divine goodness must increase. But I, my false ego, my pride, I gotta let go of that. It's an everyday task to let that go. So that's one wonderful aspect of, of sort of life and Christian discipleship and Jesus increasing that I think we can see in Cobra Kai. A second is this, and it comes uh, it, when we ask, what's this show about? Um, I'm not quite through the second season yet, but, but my take is this, is that 
one of the key things that Cobra Kai is about, and this is keenly inspiring, I think, for churches and Christian disciples, um, is that it's about how even flawed mentors, how even flawed adults can have a real and positive and even utterly crucial impact and effect in the lives of kids and specifically in the instance of the show, teenagers. Even flawed mentors, even flawed role models, even flawed adults um, can have a real crucial impact. That is just so encouraging to me uh, as a parent, (laughs) as a flawed human being myself who's now trying to raise other little human beings. Uh, I think that's so encouraging to be reminded of for churches uh, and for all who are in any way connected with raising others in the faith and children's ministries and youth ministries and, um, and even all Christians who want to and hope to influence others, to influence things and people around them in good ways and for Jesus. Um, we can all, you can all, no matter who you are, no matter what you've been through, no matter the, the messed up stuff and complications in your life now, you can be a positive influencer for Jesus and in important ways for others uh, around you. Um, I think in many ways what's at issue in Cobra Kai in, in, in this show, and in this gets into the way it thinks about karate, um, uh, but is even more explicitly at issue in Jesus' teaching and the teaching of, of, of St. Paul and St. John the Baptist is what we might call the true nature of power. The true nature of power. And it, the thing to say is this, authentic power and authentic spiritual power is not shy of weakness and failure. It's at its best when it's vulnerable and candid uh, and lets its weaknesses be in the light of God and in the light of community. Um, Authentic spirituality lets God's light shine in it and through its weaknesses. And because of that, it's strong. And as I say that, I hear John the Baptist in that penitent ascetic spirit saying, Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. And for John the strong prophet, that is a counsel, not of weakness, but ultimately of strength, of wisdom, and maturity. One of the key moments in the show in Johnny Lawrence's growth is when he confesses to his best student about his own failings, Um, as a dad and as a family man in relation to his estranged son. There's some wisdom in here about the true nature of strength and weakness, increase and decrease, the true nature of power for churches and for us, First Methodist Church in Lockhart. Because we used to be bigger, right? We, We as a congregation remember that. There used to be more people who would come on Sundays. And so Maybe we fa- uh, fear, or maybe it causes us an anxiety as we wonder, is the story we tell about ourselves a story of decline? But in acknowledging uh, that we're smaller than we used to be, uh, in, in terms of numbers of people, we're weaker than we used to be. Yet, bringing that into a light, there's an opportunity to see something, to get out of the dread and worry about it. The fact that we used to be bigger... Uh, tells nothing, uh, uh, tells us nothing about the power of God to use us now or in the future. Maybe we'll be bigger in the future. Maybe not. The power of God, the increase of Jesus Christ in us, is what we should rest in and focus on. The light of Christ is what, no matter how big or small we are, we need to let ourselves be transparent to. We're a church. We ultimately have nothing to share, if not the good news that Jesus came to save sinners, 
and we're those sinners. That's good news, uh, and it's news worth sharing. And so this ethos that we must let Jesus increase in us and we must decrease, this impacts everything when we take that harsh, freeing word of John the Baptist and internalize it. It it affects us in how we welcome others, how we use our buildings, how we treat others in our families, how we love those that we encounter in a day-to-day way. And so as we hear this teaching that Jesus must increase and we must decrease, my invitation to you is to let Christ shine not only through your strength, but let Christ shine through your weakness, through your weaknesses and our weaknesses, that God's healing strength may be shown forth and on display in this world that so badly needs the healing presence and strength of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. For the blessings of this and all our days, we thank you, gracious God. Accept, we pray, not just this money, but also our lives, freely offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. Use them both in this place and wherever you might take us. Amen.
watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You were with me. Come home, come home, come home. I should be tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me. Why should we linger and heed not his mercies, mercies for you and for me? Come Come home, come home, come home, you are weary, come has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come on, come on. Come home, come home, come home, you are weary, come home, come home, come home, you are weary, come home. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in the presence of your victorious risen love, surely you are a judgment on us and on all this world's sin. You're a judgment on all the ways that we hide in the darkness and don't come into the light in order to be healed. Yet you, Lord Jesus, who in your harsh and holy presence, you are the one who you tell us have come not to judge the world, but to save the world. And so we're given hope and strength even in our weakness. And we're given courage to pray this healing, saving, and increasing prayer. May you, Lord Jesus, increase, and may we decrease. May you, Lord Jesus, increase and may we decrease in the church universal in its mission to the world. May Christian disciples and other people of goodwill in all nations prioritize the love and truth of God over our selfishness and our egos. 
may the word of Christ be spoken boldly by the church universal. May you, Lord Jesus, increase and we decrease in this nation and in our leaders. Give us wisdom, give us humility, and seeing how to steer the ship in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of a time that's difficult in so many ways. May you, Lord Jesus, increase and may we decrease in this community and in this local church and in our families. May you increase uh, among us in our care for the suffering, for the dying, for the homeless, for the hungry. May you increase and speak a freeing word of love and healing in all those who are suffering and who are sick and who are dying this day and this week. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. comes from above is above all. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Father loves the Son, loves Jesus, and has placed all things in his hands, including you and me. And that's the best place to be. And I hope as you go forth this week, you go forth knowing that that's where you are and living like that's where you are. So as you go, go in the love of God. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And go in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now and forever. Amen. Amen.